Coping 19, brought to you by CDC and the Ad Council. If you're feeling increasingly lonely right now, you're not alone. It's totally normal. Even though we may not be able to get together in person, connecting virtually with friends and family still gives you a chance to interact with people and may help raise your spirits. Join a virtual book club, set up group text chats, or online video coffee breaks with coworkers. Find more self-care and coping tips at coping-19.org. I don't think they got any chance to win the series. They might win two games. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Well, I watched them work out this morning, and the Russians are real good skaters. But I think the Canadian boys will take them. <laughs> I think the Russians going to win it. Team Canada, 74. The underdogs with the Canadian public and the press. Selected players from the World Hockey Association. The National Hockey League and its players said no when Hockey Canada invited them to join forces. Team Soviet 74, the very best players in the entire USSR, a country where there appears to be no conflict of interest when it comes to icing the strongest possible team when so much sporting prestige is internationally at stake. It's Canadian hockey versus Soviet hockey. The founders versus the refiners. It's truly hockey versus hockey. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Greetings and salutations, everybody. How are you doing? My name is Tim Hanlon, and of course, it is Good Seats Still Available. Yes, it's our little uh, our little journey together that we uh, like to do each and every week. Uh, in our little exploration into what used to be in professional sports. Thank you for finding uh, our little show. Uh, And uh, if it's the first time that you've uh, had the opportunity to listen, well, thank you. Welcome and uh, have a seat. And uh, we look forward to hopefully uh, adding you to the uh, growing legions of uh, of listeners out there uh, and hopefully uh, something to uh, keep you a little distracted from uh, the challenges that still buffet us. Uh, as we all try to get through this virus and uh, all kinds of other stuff, uh, some glimmers of hope, I think, uh, coming uh, our way uh, politically and economically and so hopefully on the on the health front. But uh, regardless of sort of where you sit in all of that, um, how about uh, a little diversion, shall we, for a little time? Uh, and this week we're going back into hockey. We had such a, a tremendous, I, I was uh, frankly a bit stunned at the um, uh, the input, uh, the reaction uh, and the uh, the uh, seemingly love of uh, and memories from uh, our episode uh, back in, I guess it was December, right uh, around the nineteen seventy two summit series uh, that Canadian uh, USSR Soviet Union uh, epic uh, that um, uh, we were honored to kind of go back into with uh, with Rich Bendel. Uh, Uh, In our, uh, I guess that was episode number 194. Uh, We open up kind of the Pandora's box, frankly, with that conversation. And uh, we thought we'd keep going with it because uh, this week uh, we are uh, equally excited uh, to be joined by Craig Wallace as we talk about the subsequent series that happened. Uh, The 1974 uh, Forgotten Summit, which just happens to be the name of uh, of the book, the essential book by Craig Wallace, The Forgotten Summit. Uh, which was uh, a take on that uh, memorable uh, and titanic series between Team Canada and Team Soviet Union or the Soviets or USSR or whatever you want to remember them as. Uh, And as we uh, talked about in our conversation previously uh, uh, about uh, 72, right, that was you could not have um, uh, scripted that one any better. Uh, uh, Rich uh, talked about some of the more memorable moments, the ups and downs, and again, ups and downs, and and, and what a series uh, that was. And, and you know, in many respects, uh, uh, bolting 
uh, this new series or, or try to add on to uh, what was uh, arguably a, a legacy in its own right in 72, two years later was a Herculean challenge for sure. Um, but as we talk about with uh, with Craig in, in our conversation coming up in just a couple of moments, um, quite uh, amazing uh, in, and of, in and of itself in 1974, certainly reconstituted, right? We're talking about uh, a team that was comprised uh, not of NHL Canadian stars, but WHA Canadian uh, uh, hockey stars. Uh, and interestingly, the Soviet team largely comprised of uh, the same quality crew that uh, took everybody to the max in 72, um, arguably strengthened with a few other uh, new recruits, shall we say. Uh, so, you know, in many respects, I guess the WHA obviously still uh, fledgling at that time. It was frankly fledgling in all its entire lifetime for sure, um, but certainly had a lot to prove. And uh, this was the chance and interestingly, right, you got a couple of uh, big names uh, now part of the WHA at this time uh, that were part of Team Canada or the newly reconstituted Team Canada. Gordie Howe, for sure, uh, not sort of able to be uh, to play in that first 72 series because he wasn't part of the NHL. Uh, Bobby Hull, certainly very interesting in, in this process. Ger uh, Jerry Cheevers, um, Paul Henderson, uh, Frank Mihaljevic. Uh, these are all part of... Um, the uh, the the composition of 1974's version of Team Canada uh, in the Summit Series 74 style and, and arguably the Forgotten Summit. We're going to get into the intricacies and the idiosync idiosyncratic nature. Yeah, sure. There we go. Uh, of this series, also eight games. Uh, it didn't sort of turn out the same sort of uh, hugely celebratory way uh, that 72 did. I don't want to sort of tip it tip it off. Uh, or give it away if you haven't uh, sort of uh, experienced that entire series. But we're going to try to recreate some of that uh, in our conversation coming up with Craig Wallace as we talk about the 1974 Summit Series, the Forgotten Summit at that uh, in our chat coming up in just a few moments time. Now, usually this is the time where we um, kind of talk about sponsors and stuff, and we love all of our great sponsors uh, I'll just list them for you now and, and promo codes for you, sportshistorycollectibles.com, promo code GOODSEATS, 15% off all your purchases, Ebbets Field Flannels, ebbets.com, that is, uh, promo code GOODSEATS10 for 10% off all of your purchases, streakersports.com, the purveyors of sports culture, promo code GOODSEATS for 15% off all of your purchases there, oldschoolshirts.com, promo code GOODSEATS, get 10% off all of your purchases there. 417 helmets, collectible helmets, and more at 417 helmets, 417 helmets.com. Promo code good seats for 10% off all of your purchases there. And 503 Sports, the king of throwbacks, 503 sports.com. Promo code seats for 10% off all of your purchases there. No, we're going to also throw in another one that we don't have a relationship with, but in our search for something uh, uh, memorabilia worthy. Uh, to celebrate this episode about the 1974 Summit Series, the Forgotten Summit, uh, we stumbled across a, a great site. And again, we have no commercial relationship, uh, but we just thought we'd point it out to you. It's uh, customthrowbackjerseys.com. Customthrowbackjerseys, all one word, dot com. And uh, if you search up 1974 Canada, or, or I think you can even go uh, under the WHA hockey jerseys uh, section, you will see. Uh, a fantastic assemblage of uh, great, high-quality Nike throwback uh, jerseys from this series. And, and I got to tell you, we've got some imagery uh, in our social media this week and uh, certainly on our website at goodseatstillavailable.com. Uh, this is a, 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 an absolute killer uh, jersey, this red, uh, solid red with white uh, trim uh, the white Canadian maple leaf, the uh, word Canada uh, emblazoned uh, horizontally uh, across the top. It, it is this is a jersey that uh, stands the test of time. It's gorgeous. And uh, apparently at custom throwback And again, we have no commercial relationship. We just stumble across them. Um, not only can you get uh, 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 the throwback jerseys uh, with the names of folks like uh, Messrs. Henderson and Cheevers and Hall and Howe. Uh, I think there's even one for uh, Frank Mihaljevic uh, as well. You can also get your own name and number 
uh, on the back at no uh, additional charge. Um, it's great. Uh, it's fantastic. I, knock on wood. Maybe we'll get a relationship with him uh, after this little, this little uh, 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 you know, unsolicited promo. But uh, again, it's custom throwback jerseys dot com and um, great stuff there uh, across all of uh, uh, sports and stuff. Uh, but these uh, 1974 Canada Team Canada jerseys, uh, if you've seen the, the uh, pictures or you remember them, uh, these jerseys are 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 true to those, and uh, they're just fantastic. And uh, I recommend uh, those uh, to you as well, in addition to all of our great sponsors. So there you go. There's the commercial uh, the commercial ditty for this week, and uh, we appreciate uh, you, of course, uh, trying out our great sponsors and, uh, you know, and somehow in your own way, uh, celebrating and remembering, remembering, he says, uh, some of the great uh, conversations that we have in this silly little show's uh, lifetime. Uh, and uh, let's uh, get going now, shall we, with this week's episodes. It's number 199 of these we've done. Oh, my God. Uh, and here it is. It's coming up. Let's talk about the 1974 Summit Series, the Forgotten Summit. Uh, and here's the uh, conversation that, uh, that we had with Craig Wallace that we had just a couple of weeks ago. Please, as always, enjoy. Why don't you give us a little bit of a uh, a background as to how you kind of became sort of the expert, I guess, on, I guess, what we'll call sort of the Forgotten Summit, because as uh, many of our listeners know, uh, our, you know, our previous episode uh, devoted to the 72 series, which was, uh, you know, uh, game changing on, on a number of different levels and was a, a substantial event uh, in Canadian. Oh, it was massive, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, in, in Russian and, and Soviet hockey history and frankly, on the world stage, too. Uh, but before we sort of get into uh, this equally intriguing, but uh, perhaps maybe uh, less understood or remembered uh, 74 Summit Series, uh, why don't you give us a little background as to, uh, you know, your professional life your uh, and your intrigue into this series and how you kind of went deep on it and why? Okay. Um, well, professional life, um, I actually do have a day job. Um and uh, I work in human resources uh, for a national defense contractor. And uh, growing up, uh, there was always a hockey game on in my house. Uh, I grew up, I was born and raised in Toronto. And um, I remember being absolutely riveted. I was only in grade two when the 72 summit happened. But I remember being riveted by the games. And that's all people were talking about, whether it was at school, the, through the media, uh, family members, you know, my friends, parents, everyone in Canada just seemed to be utterly captivated by it. And um, it certainly produced hockey at a, a skill level pace um, that you really didn't see in the, in, in the National Hockey League. It was, uh, and, and you never, and you just didn't see the emotions and the intensity. And so when 1974 came around, um, I was a little bit older, understood uh, hockey more, was actually playing ice hockey. Um, we were all pretty excited, to, you know, to get a, to see a repeat performance. Um, and I wasn't as familiar with the uh, some of the players on Team Canada 74, simply because the WHA didn't get as much media notice. I mean... In Toronto, uh, they had the, the, the Toronto Toros had, uh, had, had moved from Ottawa the year before. Um, they they had limited uh, exposure on TV, but nothing like the you know Hockey Night in Canada and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, sure, but, um, yeah, yeah, sure, and, and obviously the, the WHA is obviously going to be a big part of this story, right? Uh, and and we've we've really? gone we've gone deep on on a lot not a lot of different sort of WHA angles, including, by the way, our our pal Dennis Murphy, who's still kicking around uh, out in Southern California, you know, being the chief instigator of said league and and his memory being fairly clear and crystal. But I've never really asked him about sort of this summit series. So I guess maybe part of the framing of this, right, is the the halo of 72, uh, the, you know, the, the, the sheer national pride in Canada of uh, winning a, a, a truly epic series. I mean, it's so dramatic and and all that kind of stuff. You could not have, as I've said in my previous episode with Rich, I mean, you could not have scripted the drama any better. Um, but I think it's really important to understand, too, maybe sort of pro hockey at the time in the early 70s, uh, not only in Canada, but in North America, right? Because the NHL, right, was 
I don't know, seven years or so, six or seven years into its own, I guess, uh, dramatic expansion from sixty, the late 60s, right? Um, Correct. And the WHA had really shown up kind of uh, uninvited, shall we say, in 72 to kind of challenge the man, so to speak, right? And and truly push hockey not only in the some of the major markets that the NHL was in, but frankly expanded into other markets that, for whatever reasons, the NHL had either ignored or... Uh, put on the back burner and all that kind of stuff. So maybe maybe that sort of helps uh, set the table a little bit as to sort of how and why this 74 series and its interesting different wrinkles sort of came about. Oh, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, the NHL had no interest in markets like Hartford or Edmonton or Winnipeg or Quebec City. And the WHA put those cities on really on the hockey map. And you know, one of the things that WHA w- wanted to do was to be viewed in the same way as the NHL, as a major league, you know, major league, as major league caliber, shall I say? And um, there was really only a couple of ways to do it. Um, they could challenge the NHL, perhaps, to a championship series between the two league champs. Uh, the NHL, of course, would never agree to it, even though the WHA. Uh, regularly issued such challenges. I mean, there was no way the NHL was going to get involved with that. And so the other way, after the 72 summit, was um, some people in the in, within the WHA thought, you know, I, I actually I believe it was Ben Hatskin, who was uh, owned the Winnipeg Jets, came up with the idea that if they played the Soviets uh, in a series, much in the same format as 72, uh, even if the WHA didn't win the series, if they were competitive, then the idea that the WHA was, quote, Bush League would be gone because the NHL was life and death to beat the Soviets, uh, you know, two years earlier. So, again, if the WHA could, my God, if they actually won the series, then they would very, nobody could say they're a Bush League, but really all they had to do was be competitive. And so the the idea of playing the, that's really how the the whole idea of the seventy four summit came about was a, the attempt by the World Hockey Association to be viewed um, on the same level as the NHL. So I mean, not unlike uh, the playbook, frankly, of of anything uh, that Dennis Murphy was involved in. Right? This is this feels promotional with a capital P and maybe in all caps. Right? Uh, the ultimate sort of uh, hey, look at us and uh, pay attention to us. And this seems like the ultimate PR vehicle. Oh, and that's exactly what it was. And for, you know, September of 1974, when the series was going on, uh, the NHL was very effectively knocked off the front pages of all the sports sections across Canada. Because this, this, the WHA had finally got the media attention that they wanted, and they were being... They were being covered by the biggest sports writers in Canadian media, and uh, the the entire world of hockey was was uh, looking at their best players. Well, and I guess the 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 Canadian populace, right, uh, certainly had sort of many still warm fuzzies around sort of uh, just the the epical uh, uh, adventure and or victory and uh, uh, and the just the the sheer you know. Uh, monstrosity of the publicity and and uh, the, the national pride right of having won the 72 series uh but you know in some respects i guess you know maybe this is a cynical years after the fact looking backward in time kind of comment right but it's almost as like um you know the original rocky was pretty darn good but you know rocky 2 uh, where does the story go from here is this really a good idea was there any kind of hesitancy as this was being bandied about or was this kind of like the wha saying you know what this is a a great way to get attention for us pretty quickly and who better and how better than by resurrecting the good vibes and the amazing story of what happened two years prior. Oh, I, I agree. Um, I'm not aware of any hesitancy. Um, the, you know, the WHA was gun ho and so was the Soviet union. The Soviets were stunned at their loss to Canada two years earlier. And they wanted another shot at the, as they called the Canadian professionals and the NHL was not, interested in getting back involved in a series like that again because quite frankly they know that there was a, a a pretty good possibility they might not win it i mean it had taken everything those players had two years earlier 
1972 to win that series. And they needed, you know, had to get a few lucky breaks as well. And so this, the, the, the NHL was not going to play the Soviets in that type of format again. And um, so this was considered win-win for the WHA and the Soviet Union. Yeah, this is also interesting, too, because, again, the thing about the timing, right? So 72 was the first year of the WHA, but that original Summit Series occurred literally in the preseason of the NHL and arguably the, the, the preseason of the WHA. But the decision was made, and I don't, frankly don't remember how, but it seems pretty well. I, there was no, effectively, there was no WHA around the, the original Summit Series when it was announced in the summer of 72, right? So it wasn't even an issue, per se, of quote-unquote WHA players getting a chance to play in that series because there really essentially was no league, right? Yeah, well, the league started in the fall of 72, but um, the preseason, the WHA preseason had just started when Team Canada returned home. Um, I remember reading a biography, uh, or an autobiography by uh, Derek Sanderson, who had been named to Team Canada 72 and then dropped when he signed with the WHA. And he talked about... um, coming through is either the Toronto or Montreal airports to go to for an exhibition game uh, and uh, seeing Team Canada there, and uh, they had just arrived home. And Sanderson was kind of kicking himself, saying he, was re- he regretted taking the WHA money because he could have been part of that wonderful experience. But um, to, to your point, though, the, uh, the WHA was, re- I guess it had just started operating in the preseason, but they hadn't, the league itself hadn't started the regular season for the uh, when the seventy two summit happened. Right, but but not not an unimportant issue uh, as we get into seventy four in the WHA because there were two standout players, right? That in essence, well, you mentioned Derek Sanderson. Derek Sanderson, I mean, obviously he he a more key player as well. But but even two sort of even shall we say hallowed brighter lights, right? That uh, I wouldn't say the WHA ensnared them, so to speak, but. Uh, were the WHA was instrumental essentially, or their their uh, uh, defections, shall we say, uh, in their ability to play in the '72 series originally? I, Hull and and Howe, Bobby Hull and Gordy Howe, right? I mean, um, two different guys, two different situations, but uh, m- maybe a moment on how they couldn't play in '72, and maybe why '74 was almost a, an opportunity for them to be part of that maybe in the second round of the, this kind of event. Yeah, well, uh, you know, the Bobby Hall really put the uh, WHA on um, on the map when uh, he jumped from the Chicago Blackhawks to the Winnipeg Jets. And it's very, in- interestingly enough, um, every team in the WHA contributed towards Bobby Hall's million-dollar signing bonus. A million dollars in 1972 was a huge amount of money. And the Jets reached out to all the other WHA owners, and they all agreed that, you know, even though Bobby Hall may play for an opposing team, um, when the Winnipeg Jets came to town, you were almost uh, assured of a very large crowd. And Bobby Hall, if Bobby Hall was in your league, you weren't Bush League. Well, actually, and, and, and quick parenthetical, I think most most of our listeners will see that that uh, in many respects, actually, I think, almost became the model for a lot of other challenger leagues in the years uh, thereafter. Was sort of this collective let's let's take one for the proverbial uh, for all of us, right? Uh, Pele, uh, we've discovered, you know, in 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 seventy five when he came to the Cosmos in the North American Soccer League, there was not sort of well known a collective passing of the plate. Donald Trump in all his you know, ridiculousness, uh, uh, clearly evident in the in the 80s, tried to do the same thing when he hired uh, Doug Flutie to play for the Generals. That didn't go very well, by the way. But but not interesting that that's almost like a a, a paradigm uh, 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 definition or, or changer right there uh, in itself. Agreed. Agreed. And uh, Bobby Hall had been named the Team Canada 72. But um, when it became when it became known publicly that he had signed with the World Hockey Association, uh, Team Canada dropped him. The rules uh, around Team Canada '72 was you had to have a valid NHL contract that was good through it through the '72-'73 season. And even the, uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, Justin Trudeau's father, tried to intercede to get the uh, whole permission to play for Team Canada, and the NHL was adamant they were 
going to go. They were going to war with the WHA, and they were not going to showcase WHA players on their team, Canada. Gordie Howe was different. Um, Gordie Howe had actually retired after the seventy seventy one season. So when the seventy two summit came by, he was uh, working as a vice president with the Detroit Red Wings, and very unhappy because he felt he was being wasted. Um, and so in the summer of seventy three. The WHA's Houston Arrows shocked the hockey world by drafting his two sons, Mark and Marty, who were both under the age of 20. And at the time, the NHL had a rule that you had to be a minimum of 20 years old to be drafted out of the junior leagues. And uh, the Houston Arrows checked and said, hmm, we don't have that rule. So they signed Mark and Marty, or drafted Mark and Marty. And then Gordy, uh, as the story goes, um, spoke to the uh, general manager of the Arrows and said, how would you like a third how? Um, so, you know, two of the greatest legends in Canadian hockey history hadn't played for Team Canada 72, but I, w- did play for Team Canada 74. So that, w- that was huge news. I mean, and there certainly was some concern um, among a lot of Canadian sports writers that, uh, you know, Gordy Howe was 46 years old. How in name of you know how in name of earth was he going to be able to keep up with the Soviets, who certainly played at a pace very few NHL teams ever played at? Well, give me a sense of the the summer and fall of of seventy four after all this had been announced and stuff, because I I can also imagine the sports writers in particular, uh, I don't know, maybe kind of trying to cast aspersion on this as being sort of a lighter weight kind of challenge. Oh, very much. Yeah, because at WHA, right, only two years old at the time, and, and you know, uh, hockey purists, maybe at the time, or, or certainly since, probably would look at the WHA as, as fledgling, certainly more exciting, but, but you know, comprised of more, shall we say, minor league talents and, and some, some quality stars that were lured over and maybe, frankly, some aging players you know, it wasn't necessarily I maybe perceived or reality as quality, if you will, or top notch or, or legacy as the NHL. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. I, I think a, a fair way to describe the WHA um, after the end of their second season, so let's say the summer of 1974, was that they were a significant step above the American Hockey League, which was the highest of the quote, minor leagues but probably a notch below the NHL in overall quality of play. Um, Rick Smith, who I interviewed extensively for my book, uh, The Forgotten Summit, and Brad Selwood, who I also interviewed, um, both were very good NHL defensemen when they jumped to the World Hockey Association. Um, but, But as Rick Smith told me, he said the difference in the leagues was most WHA teams had 10 to 12 NHL caliber players. Then the rest would be players who really wouldn't have made the NHL. Um, And, you know, a lot of WHA teams had one or two good quality defensemen. The rest were, well, (laughs) kind of scary out there. And there was a definite drop-off in the caliber of goaltending. Now, interestingly enough, though, Team Canada 74 had one of the best goalies in the world in Jerry Cheever's. Cheevers had backstopped the Boston Bruins to two Stanley Cups in the early 70s. He was another member, uh, player who had been dropped from the Team Canada roster because he'd signed with the World Hockey Association. And um, so a lot of reporters, when they looked at the overall lineup for Team Canada 74, the basic gist of it was great net with Jerry Cheevers. Uh, God help them if they have to go to a, the, the two or three goalies, Don McLeod or Gilles Graton. On defense, they had two stellar defensemen, Pat Stapleton, who had played very, very well for Team Canada 72, and J.C. Tremblay, um, who was also named to Team Canada 72 and then dropped before going to the WHA. Um, after, tr- after Stapleton and Tremblay, they had a lot of solid defensemen in people like Rick Smith, uh, Rick Lee, Brad Selwood. Um, but there was a real question of whether those, those guys would be able to um, adequately protect Cheevers. I mean, could they keep up with the Soviets? Where do, you know, 
we remember back in 1972, we saw uh, Soviet players like Valery Harlamov, you know, blow around superstars like Brad Park or Serge Savard. I mean, <laughs> people were saying, what, what are they going to do to like Rick Lee or Paul Schmier? Um, and then on the forwards, they thought the uh, actually Team Canada was pretty solid on the left wing with Paul Henderson, who, you know, the Hero 72. He had jumped to the Toronto Toros in 1974. Uh, he could no longer stand playing for a hockey team owned by Errol Ballard. Frank Mahovlich, who had uh, been on the 72 team and played, quite frankly, he'd been horrible. Um, he was getting another shot at the Soviets. Bobby Hall, the Golden Jet, who we've, we've talked about. Um, they had some really good quality left wingers. Center, centermen were, they were considered okay. Um, on right wing, you had, uh, you know, Mr. Hockey, Gordy Howe. Um, what, and so, and, but the question with him was, could he keep up? You know, he's 46 years old. That's ancient for a professional athlete. And, uh, but overall, you know, the, the, the talk was, um, they were going to be, they were definitely going to be underdogs. Um, Rick Smith told me though, that, um, they had received very detailed um, instructions on what type of physical condition to be in. And he said pretty well, they, they all took that um, very seriously. They showed up in far better shape than Team Canada 72 had. Um, Lars Eric Schoberg, who had just signed with the Winnipeg Jets from Sweden, um, acted as a consultant during Team Canada's training camp, which was held in Edmonton. And Schoberg added a lot of knowledge to the players. They watched all the games from 72 extensively. And interestingly enough, the head coach of Team Canada, Billy Harris, um, Harris had actually been the head coach of the Swedish national team in the 71 uh, World Hockey Championships and the 1972 Olympics. Uh, He was a former very good NHL player with the Toronto Maple Leafs in the 50s and 60s. And in 1969, he had regained his amateur status and played for Canada in the World Hockey Championships. So Billy Harris was one of the most knowledgeable people in Canada regarding international hockey. And was all the, all the players I spoke to just raved about him as a, as a hockey coach and as a real gentleman. And um, Harris really... Um, put in a very detailed game plan with the players, and a lot of that focused around um, he, he, staying out of the penalty box. He kept preaching that. He said, we need to dial down the emotions a little bit. You know, at times, Team Canada 72 would, appeared to be almost out of control emotionally. Well, Harris told his players, you know, when we score, you know, be a little bit more like the Soviets. Don't, don't be, you know... We we don't have to have a massive celebration, and when they scored, let's not get down. Let's try and keep things more on a, a little bit more of an even keel, shall we say? How about how about the fans and the press? Uh, was the anticipation uh, and and uh, the expectation as as high and and uh, uh, you know just passionate as the previous one, or or is that just impossible to match? Frankly, yeah, it's impossible to match, and I think. Um, hockey, you know, actually on the internet, uh, Hockey Canada produced a very good documentary on the 74 Summit. And when you, at the very beginning, they're interviewing fans in, in Quebec City. And it was pretty split whether the, among the Canadian fans on whether they thought Team Canada could beat them. Team Canada was definitely the underdog. Um, if you looked at the hockey news from back in that time period from you know, I, as I recall, we seeing a hockey news poll out of 25 hockey writers. 13 of them thought Canada would win. Um, eight, eight or nine thought they would lose, and then a couple pred- predicted the series would end in a tie. So there was a, there was the, there was I think a good way to put it. There was a lot of curiosity. So you know, because although Team Canada 74 definitely lack the the overall elite talent of Team Canada 72. On the other hand, they were far better prepared. They knew what they were getting into. Team Canada 72 went in completely blind. Team Canada 74 was going, and they knew exactly what the task was ahead of them, and they were very, very well prepared. Well, how about, uh, so this is also now, again, going to be in... 
what, September, right? Which is going to be the right. preseason once again. Um, mm -hmm. Curious that it wouldn't be, say, during the season, but I guess that just from a, a logistics perspective, getting, if you will, an all-star team, if you will, Canada yeah. based and or WHA centric uh, together probably makes the most sense, I guess. Um, uh, how does um, how some of the mechanics sort of get set up? Because it, it looks like uh, it was uh, in terms of of operation fairly similar, if not almost exactly the same as the format and the and the locations uh, and the sort of the dynamics and I guess the rules too of what uh, transpired in uh, in seventy two an eight game series. Uh, the first uh, games in Canada, the second series set in Moscow. Uh, any new wrinkles or differences, or, or was there a reason as to why it was sort of sort of framed largely the same? Um, I, I I have to believe they wanted to kind of follow the NHL format, um, so I think that, that way they could possibly compare themselves positively to how the NHL um, did. One of the big differences, though, um, again, the players showed up in far better physical condition. They had a 16-day training camp, but a huge difference, or two big differences, I should say, from 72, was Team Canada 74 had a much smaller roster. As we recall, in 72, uh, four players quit Team Canada, went home because they were angry over lack of ice time. Billy Harris promised, came in with a much smaller lineup or roster, he did promise everybody they would play, and he was bound and bent that he was going to live up to it. But another big difference was exhibition games. Team Canada 72 had three inter-squad games. Uh, when they played the Soviet Union in game one, that was the first time the team had ever actually had to played a game together. And Team Canada 74 was not going to make that um, mistake. Uh, Bill Hunter, who was the owner and operator of the Edmonton Oilers and he had been a long-time fixture in the Western Canadian Junior Hockey League, arranged with the Western uh, Junior League to put for, the, for the juniors to put together an all-star team, and they played five exhibition games against Team Canada in various small cities across um, Western Canada, places like Brandon, Manitoba, and Red Deer, Alberta. And uh, I remember Rick Smith telling me, you know, he said the competition wasn't the best. He said, you know, we had guys like Bobby Hall and Gordy Howe playing against juniors. But he said it actually gave us five invaluable games to try out line combinations, defensive pairings. And he said those kids could fly. So he said that was good training for us as well, you know, because the, the pace those kids could play at was pretty, pretty intense. And he said, there's nothing more valuable than the actual game experience when you're getting ready for a big series. So um, that was, I thought, a very wise move. They may have tried to, um, they may have been better off if they'd been able to talk to maybe uh, Finland or Sweden and maybe brought a Finnish or Swedish team over for a couple of games to get them more ready that, you know, higher state of level of competition than the juniors. But overall, it, that was a very good move. So by the time Team Canada and the Soviets met in game one in Quebec City for the 74 summit, you know, Canada had a 16-day training camp under their belt. I think they could have gone, it would have been better to maybe even add an extra week to that, but it is what it is. But they also had those five invaluable games under their belt as well. So the line, you know, line combinations and defensive pairings, they all knew, had a good idea of, you know, how they were clicking. And Billy Harris got an idea how, how sharp his goalies were looking, too, in, in game, game situations. Yeah, it's also interesting as well that uh, there's also uh, uh, the there were intermediary games, if you will, between uh, the Canadian uh leg and the russian leg um Correct. not unlike the 72 series a couple of uh, looks like a game in finland and sweden in between that again sort of as a uh a tune up or as a whatever uh so it's interesting that's sort of that's truly the ultimately forgotten component of these both of these series right are these little intermediary games i think it looks like in this case there's also a game on their way back as well afterwards when they were coming Correct. back to Russia, the, the Canadians. So in some respects, this is also, yeah, this is another sort of element that just truly has been forgotten in, in, the, in the course of remembering. Very much so. And both Brad Selwood and Rick Smith made it clear that 
there was a big difference between those games in Finland and Sweden than what happened two years early with Canada when they played two exhibition games in Stockholm. And, you know, as we recall, in 72, Team Canada had practically been booed out of their final game in Vancouver. And in um, Stockholm, they were accused by the media of being, you know, thugs and even, quote, gangsters for their rough style of play. And that's where Team Canada really started coming together as a team. You know, they'd been booed out of Canada. They were being ripped apart in in Sweden. And it was almost they developed this, you know, it's, it's us against the world. Where when T- Team Canada 74 um, left Canada and flew to Helsinki, both of, both Smith and Selwood said it was a wasted week. We got, quote, fat in Scandinavia. Um the games Canada played as well as they had to. They beat uh, Finland eight to three and Sweden four to three. But in both games, they would they played in kind of fits and starts, as I put it. Um, you know, they would start off fast, jump into a lead, take take the foot off the gas, allow the Finns or the Swedes to uh, get a couple of goals, and they put the you know put the pedal to the metal again. And uh, you just can't play that way against the Soviets. They, you know, they needed better competition. And uh, Brad Selwood told me after the series, after the final game in Moscow, they had a final game in Prague against the Czechoslovakian national team. And he said, uh, we made a huge mistake there. He said, none of us wanted to go to Prague. Um, we didn't want to play them. We just wanted to go home. He said, they said the game sh- sh- had no purpose. He said, what would have been better is maybe play a game in, in Helsinki against the Finns or in Sweden against the Swedes. Give our guys who haven't had a lot of ice time, give them lots of ice time. And then before going to Moscow, go to Prague and play one or two against the Czechs because he said they were really physical, far more physical than the Swedish or Finnish teams were. And, and they were far more talented. He said... Give us one or two games in Prague with our with our lineup, and we would have been really battle tested. And going into uh, Moscow, instead, he said uh, we really got soft in Scandinavia. So, uh, where was the? Um, and we'll get into the the, the sort of the games uh, maybe more specifically. But where was the WHA in all of this? It would seem to be that there there would be no no stone left unturned or no stops pulled, frankly, to maximize the. Uh, the promotional value for all this. I mean, in some respects, this was also the Team Canada flag, but it was also probably uh, the opportunity for the logoed flag of the WHA, frankly, to be flown, shall we say, figuratively, simultaneously, if not more so, because this was not just about Canadian pride. This was also about the WHA brand fledgling as oh, it was. Yeah. Very much so. I mean, well, certainly with uh, traveling to all the games were WHA owners and officials, um, in the media at the time made it very clear that this was the WHA Team Canada. Um, so the and, yes, sorry, it was, and, and by extension or maybe unspoken was this wasn't necessarily the best we could do as Canada. Maybe exactly, and that you know for for some I think for a lot of Canadians that was kind of you know we were cheering we were obviously wanted our team to win. But we had a built-in excuse because that clearly was not the best team Canada could send. I mean, if you thought, think about it, um, there was probably five or six players on Team Canada 74 that would have made um, a, a team made up of the best Canadian, Canadian professional hockey players. I mean, if the WHA and NHL had combined to... Um, you know, set put play the Soviets again in a summit series. I think that I'd say about four or five, maybe six of the players on Team Canada seventy four would have even been asked to try out for such a team. We knew it, we knew it was a good team, but it was not the best. Yeah, I, it was also interesting too. I mean, again, this seems again in, in retrospect, right? But uh, why the WHA uh, perhaps didn't sort of try to do a league centric thing versus the Soviets, uh, still borrowing from the summit series model of 72, but I can, I can see where uh, tapping into the Canadian success in the previous one, that, that a Canadian WHA model would have been more, I guess, promotionally powerful. But you know, if the WHA, I guess this is a confluence, right. Of, 
whose needs are being served most, right? The WHA obviously trying to serve its need as a fledgling league to show that there is top quality as as the NHL is. But then again, it's not the WHA against the Soviets. It's the Canadians and WHA comprised of Canadians facing the Soviets. Okay. So I, I'm just curious as to how that sort of how that, that well, mindset sort of came about to, to make that the case. Well, I think, um, interestingly enough, Tim, if the WHA had waited a year, so let's say had the series in 1975, they may very well have actually had a team WHA versus the Soviets. But you have to remember, in, in 1974, um, the best players in the WHA were Canadian. There were not a lot of... Re- high-profile non-Canadian players in the WHA at the time. The Winnipeg Jets had just signed Anders Hedbear, Ulf Nilsson, Lars Erik Schoberg, and a couple players from Finland. The Toronto Toros had got two uh, Czechoslovakian stars, Vasilev Nadamansky and Richard Farda, to um, defect to come to Toronto. Um, but that was... They had yet to play a game in the WHA, so... To your point, I think a team WHA could have been very, a very, a very strong possibility, but it wouldn't have been in 1974. It would have been in the following years when those players had established themselves as true elite uh, players. Interesting. So, so, so yeah. broadening it to team D- WHA wouldn't have necessarily gotten them that much more talent, so no. to speak, given the preponderance of Canadians in the league. Yeah, at that point, you're absolutely correct. Interesting. I also noticed, too, and let's maybe get some of the games. I, I'm just curious as to uh, uh, four games in, in in Canada, why Edmonton was not one of the four places oh. uh, versus Quebec, Toronto, Winnipeg, and Vancouver. Very simple reason. The Northlands Coliseum hadn't been built yet, so the Edmonton Gardens, where the Oilers played, I think it only held 6,000 people. So they they weren't um, they they they, they um, that wasn't an, that wasn't going to be an option. Interestingly enough, though, um, one uh, question I always had was why did Team Canada have their training camp in in Western Canada, then fly to Quebec City, meet meet, meet up with the Soviets, work their way back across the country to have play game formed in Vancouver and then have an extra long flight to Europe from Vancouver, as opposed to perhaps forcing the Soviets to fly from Moscow to Vancouver. You know what I'm saying? Open the series in Western Canada. If you're Team Canada, you're already out there. So that all that extra travel also uh, carried, um, was a burden to the players. And a, lot of those team, a lot of those players on Team Canada were older players, too. And... Um, they would have taken some of the travel burden off them if they'd actually started the series in Western Canada and worked their way east and led to a shorter flight from uh, Quebec to um, Europe. Yeah, very interesting. So give me, give me give us a sense. So we're talking September 17th, 1974, Game 1 in Quebec City. Uh, give us a sense of sort of uh, the lead-up, uh, the, the game, uh, the expectations. Obviously, this is the home of the uh, Quebec Nordiques. They've been in the... Uh, uh, in the league for two years since the very beginning of of the league, so they're uh, obviously you have a and obviously a well established uh, uh, hockey culture there. What's the what's the vibe? What's the expectation? Uh, what well, plays the, out, and what what do people kind of expect? And were they excited, disappointed? What? Very. Ex- there was a lot of excitement. Um, the Colisee was packed that night. Um, a lot of dignitaries there. The question a lot of the media had was, how is Team Canada, with a lot of older players, again, J.C. Trombley, 37, Ralph Backstrom was turning 37, Cordy Howe, 46, Bobby Hall and Frank Mahovlich were in their mid-30s. There was a real question of whether these players could keep up. Interesting, in Game 1, was actually dominated for 50 of the 60 minutes by Canada. The Canadian players, as old, much older than a lot of the Soviet players, were matching them stride by stride, at times winning races to the pucks. Um, Billy Harrison put in a very disciplined game plan, um, really pushing to, to, for all the forwards to always be back, back-checking. He said, we can't have any odd-man breaks. 
And um, the Canadians played a very good physical game without taking stupid penalties. And um, they opened the scoring about 12 minutes into the first period. Johnny McKenzie, former Boston Bruin, was set up really nicely by Andre Lacroix. Um, the Soviets had taken a 3-2 lead in the third period. Um, Valerie Harlamov, who had scored two spectacular goals in Game 1 of the 72 series, scored an, probably the most beautiful goal in the whole 74 series in the second period. But with about six minutes to go, the game was uh, the Soviets were up 3-2, to two, and a lot of people, I think, were thinking, well, you know, the Canadians have hung in there gamely, but the better team's winning. And as I put in my book, The Forgotten Summit, then the Soviets made an error players in North America had learned, long ago learned never to do. They left Bobby Hull unguarded in their zone with room to shoot. And Hull was set up nicely by Andre Lacroix and Johnny McKenzie and just put a bullet past Vladislav Trechak to tie the game. Five minutes, 51 seconds remaining in the hockey game. Soviets leading 3-2. to two. Canadians with Johnny McKenzie and Lacroix keeping it inside. Right up, right And then the Canadians poured it on. Trechak made a couple of dazzling stops off Mark uh, Tardif and Mike Walton. And with about 30 seconds to go in the game, Gordie Howe sent Frank Mahovlich in a lone breakaway on Trechak. And uh, the big M, unfortunately, he missed the net. And the game ended in a three-all tie. And um, Billy Harris and the Soviet coach, coach Boris Kulagin, uh, shook hands after the game and... Uh, Kulagin said through a translator, very nice. And Harris smiled and just said, yeah, the spectators won tonight because it, it was a tremendous hockey game. And I think for a lot of Canadians, there was a sense of relief that Team Canada 74 had not been blown off the ice. They were actually a pretty darn good hockey team. So it allayed some fears then, I guess, that, uh, that at least the series was going to be somewhat competitive and perhaps very. that the WHA players could hold their own. Very much so. Um, a lot of Canadians, you know, Jerry Cheevers had been brilliant in that for Canada. A lot of Canadians said, man, we could have used him two years ago. But the players who a lot of people didn't think that highly of, the Ricky Lees, the Brad Selwoods, the Rick Smith, Paul Schmears on defense, they played very, very well. They, uh, Jerry Cheevers got a lot of support out there. The forwards, stayed with their checks, came back and back-checked. I mean, it was a very well-executed uh, game plan Billy Harrison put in, and the players played it to perfection. And to be fair, Canada dominated the most most of the play, and they really they deserved a better fate than just a tie. But I think most Canadians were satisfied with it because they were expecting worse. All right, a couple of days later, the, uh, the show moves to Toronto. Uh, a much better result for the Canadians. My sense Absolutely. is that this, this second game was a little less, shall we say, well-played by the Canadians, but, but frankly a more gutsier or grittier kind of performance that kind of willed their way to kind of winning this game? Exactly. That's actually exactly what Billy Harris said. He didn't think his team had played near as well. They weren't far off, but they, it was a very gritty performance. Um, Again, Team Canada stayed out of the penalty box. Um, they had actually jumped into a 3 nothing lead when uh, Alexander Yakashev, who had torn Canada apart two years earlier, scored to make it 3-1. to one. And then, very interesting, Vladimir Petrov, who was an outstanding centerman for the Soviets, uh, fired a shot past Jerry Cheevers that came in, went in and out of the net in an instant. The gold judge hesitated before putting the red light on, but the Canadian referee, Tom Brown, overruled it, saying he didn't see the puck go in the net. That would have made the score 3-2 to two, um, and maybe made a very different game. Um, but from there, the Canadians um, got another goal, a late goal by J.C. Tremblay, and pulled off a 4-1 to one victory. It, again, maybe they didn't play quite as well as they had two nights earlier in Quebec, but Team Canada was very much the better team. Soviets bumping at center ice. Harlemov down the left wing now. Could not beat J.C. Tremblay. We have five seconds left. Here's a break for Bernier. to get his balance to get away a shot. He shoots. Kretschak hangs on at the buzzer to end the second period. 
Another of the many, many scoring chances that Team Canada has failed to cash in on, Howie, in this period. And interesting, you know, they, there is talk that um, the Canadian players two years earlier had looked at each other after the first period of Game 1 and said, oh my God, this is going to be a long series. The Soviets were saying that now. They had come in underestimating Team Canada 74. They could see the media, and they knew this wasn't the best team that our country could ice. But now, they could have very easily been down two games to nothing at this point. They were fortunate they were only down by a single game. And uh, the next stop was Winnipeg. So the Canadians perhaps felt like they were on a roll, and... uh... You know, I, but, um, you know, as as last uh, two years prior at the series, right, it, it seems like drama was just around the corner and it wasn't necessarily going to be as as easy as that. And perhaps like maybe it feels like the Soviets kind of uh, going into Winnipeg uh, on the 21st of uh, September kind of maybe made some adjustments, maybe or, or uh, maybe I, give me a sense of what game three was like, because obviously the result quite different. Oh, it was very different. Well. First, there was some concerns with Canada. Um, Gordy Howe had banged up his ribs in the first period of Game 2, and by the end of the first period, he was in his street clothes. He was not going to play in um, Game 3. Frank Mahovlich, who had played a, a good Game 1, had been invisible in Game 2. He, he was taken out of the lineup. Jerry Cheever's father-in-law had a massive heart attack in the stands at Maple Leaf Gardens during Game 2. And he was uh, in critical condition in the hospital, so Cheevers was staying with his family. He wasn't going to play. That was very ominous. Um, Cheevers had been brilliant in games one and two, just fabulous. His I'm sorry, did, did, was didn't, his, on, didn't, his, did, didn't his father actually pass on per, because of that incident after? He did when the team got to Moscow. Oh, that's that's, that's, um, that's yes. totally tragic. Very. Um Don Jerry Cheever's backup was Don McLeod, who he well he was very definitely the number two goalie for a good reason. He he had um, had very limited action. He saw very limited action in the National Hockey League. He really became he got his real first chance to start in in Houston in the World Hockey Association. The previous season he had had a tremendous year. Um. But he had not had a good training camp. He had not looked sharp. And he, had, um, he didn't look particularly sharp against the juniors. And there was a real concern putting him out there against the Soviets. Uh, Billy Harris also decided that, you know, Cheevers couldn't play. Gordy Howe couldn't play. He had promised all his players that somebody, they would get into at least one game. And he thought, you know, you know what? Why not do it now? We're ahead in the series. Worst case scenario happens and we lose. We're tied. This is still better than a lot of people thought we'd be, uh, uh, th- that we would do. So he took Rick Lee and Brad Selwood out of the lineup, who had been so good in games one and two, very solid defensively, and replaced them with Marty Howe and Al Hamilton. Uh, again, Don McLeod replaced Jerry Cheevers. Uh, other players going into the lineup were Jimmy Harrison, Tom Webster, Mark Tardif uh, had sat out game two. He was going in back into the lineup. And um, it, one, of the, one of the things that became very obvious to all of us as we watched Game 3 was Team Canada was getting tired. The first two games they had played were played at a pace and skill level you'd rarely see, even in the, in the National Hockey League. And this was their third such game in six days. And in fact, Game 3 was played on a Saturday afternoon, not Saturday night. And a number of the Canadian players said they were, they were getting exhausted even though they'd come to training camp in really good shape. And Game 3 turned out to be a bit of a debacle. Um, the Soviet, it was one all at the end of the first period. By the end of the second, the Soviets were up 4-2. The Canadian forwards were not back-checking. They were kind of drifting in, in and out of position. The defense was struggling, and Don McLeod was struggling. And the Soviets kind of blew it all open at the beginning of the third period, uh, jumped into a 7-2 lead. And then for about two or three minutes, Canada showed, came back. Uh, Paul Henderson got a pair of goals. There's Bernier got one. Rink wide pass over Al Hamilton. Back out in front, the title, title race again. Back over front, the Bernier shoots. Oh, the a score! Quick caught it and lost it. The 
it's a seven to five. I remember watching that game thinking, wow, are we going to come back? You know, we're down 7-2, to two and all of a sudden it's 7-5. to five. But, no, this, <laughs> the Soviets popped another one and ended up winning the game 8-5, to five, and they were very, very definitely the better team that day. Um, but Billy Harris stuck to his guns and said uh, he was happy. He got uh, a lot of players, some of the lesser lights on the team, shall we say. Um, they got to play, and... Because it, you know, and even when I talked to Selwood, Brad Selwood and Rick Smith, neither one of them faulted Billy Harris for doing that. I mean, Rick Smith said Billy Harris was a true gentleman in every manner of the word, and every, and if he made a promise, he was going to keep it. So then there was you know one more game to go in Canada, um, which was uh, the Monday night in uh, Vancouver on the twenty third. And uh, an interesting game on a number of different levels. Uh, let's set the tone there. It feels to me like the Canadians kind of let this one slip away in Vancouver. Oh, my goodness, yes. So going into Vancouver, this was a game Canada desperately wanted. Um, they wanted to leave Canada ahead in the series because they knew they would have faced some real challenges in Europe. And one of the things we have to keep in mind is for the Canadians going to Europe, most North Americans aren't nearly as worldly as Europeans. I mean, if you if you look at a map of Europe, you could be if you were driving, you could be in several different countries in one day. Um, Europeans were were used to traveling to um, like hockey players in particular were used to traveling from country to country, dealing with foreign languages and such. Where here in North America. It's basically, you know, we travel from Canada to the United States, and outside of going into Quebec, there's really no, no issues with languages, different foods and such. So, as Rick Smith said, this was a game we badly needed. We wanted to go and leave Canada ahead. Uh, Jerry Cheevers, uh, his, fa- his father-in-law was still in the hospital, but he rejoined the team. He'd be back in that. That was a huge boost. Um, Ricky Lee moved back into the lineup. Inc- interestingly enough, though, Marty Howe, who had been in played in Game 3 and, quite frankly, was terrible. He had a terrible night or a terrible afternoon. He remained in the lineup, and Rick, Rick Smith told me, he said that was a signal. Marty, he said Marty was a great guy, a really nice man, uh, a capable defenseman, but he said he was really kind of over his head at this point in his career playing at this level. And he said... We thought Marty was only in the lineup to keep Gordy Howe happy because Gordy was back in the lineup. And this was going to be a game where Gordy could play against the Soviets with both his boys, Mark and Marty. And, and as Rick Smith said, a team is supposed to be bigger than any one person. This was not a good move. Um, so, so, you know, the game started off very fast-paced. Soviets got a quick one that broke into the lead. Um, Gordy Howe scored a beautiful goal set up by Ralph Backstrom. Uh, the Soviets made it two to one, and then Bobby Hull really exploded. From the face off, the car breaks in. Across the Hull, hat trick! <laughs> They're going crazy in Vancouver. And I'm sure across the country, too. You gotta watch this. Just get center pass by LaCroix. Perfect. But watch the speed in which Bobby Hull gets it away. Just on the toe of the stick. Now watch LaCroix hang on to it. He's looking for Hull. Look at that little snap shot. And where did it go? Hey, it took us three games to learn something. But oh, just perfect. Watch it again. On and up. Bobby Hull scored a hat trick in the first period. Frank Mahovlich got another. And Canada was up 5-2. to two. And a lot of hockey, pe- uh, hockey journalists said, that was the single finest period of hockey any Canadian team had ever played against the Soviet Union. And the Soviets had not had a bad period. They'd just been blown off the ice. I mean, Bobby Hall's goals, he, he scored them from three different spots of the ice on three different shot, types of shots. It was um, unbelievable. Um, the only goal of the second period went to the Soviets, Alexander Yakashev, who had had a hat trick in Game 3. Uh, far, one of the hardest shots I've ever seen. Uh, they nearly knocked Jerry Cheevers over on the way into the net. And then uh, the third period, uh, on a couple of occasions, Canada almost made it 6-3. to three. And with less than three minutes to go, the Soviets scored a pair of goals to tie the game at 5-all. 
And it was just heartbreaking. I mean, if you'd said before the series, if you'd asked the Team Canada players before the series, would you have been happy after the first four games in the series to to be tied? I think they all would have said yes. But looking back now, as Rick Smith told me, he said, we were the better team in game one. We should have beaten them. We beat them in game two. Game three is, well, it is what it is. It was a catastrophe. And when you have a team, when you have your opponent down five to two, you should win the game. So he said, on one hand, we were happy. We bounced back after that horrible game in Winnipeg. Um, but then we had this terrible, this letdown. And it wasn't that Canada took the, you know, took their foot off the gas. You know, Vladislav Trechak made some tremendous saves in the third period to keep Canada from scoring. And on one particular play, Andre Lacroix, who was just dominating the Soviets on faceoffs, won a faceoff in the Soviet zone, drawing the puck back to Johnny McKenzie, who fired a bullet past Trechak, only to see it bounce off the post. So it was, it was, you know, certainly a lot for us, for us Canadian hockey fans. You felt good that you were tied, but you knew you could have done better. And darn it all, we should have done better. All right, we we talked about the uh, the uh, 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 intermezzo games uh, that mm-hmm. being in Finland and Sweden were those uh, before they uh, went to to Moscow, which is where the last four games of the series uh, uh, occurred. And we'll get to that in a second. But were any were those two games? Uh, televised in, in Canada, the Finland game and the Sweden game, uh, those intermediary games? Do you know? I don't believe so. Um, in the Hockey Canada documentary I mentioned earlier, there is some footage from both those games in there. Um, I, I believe they were broadcast locally in Helsinki and Gothenburg, but um, I don't recall them being broadcast here. They were on the radio, but not televised. Yeah, interesting. I mean, in today's day and age, you think, well, okay, well, uh, you know, that 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 story would, would be part of, uh, you know, the drama in the series, right? Because it's prep, it's it's a lot of, you know, you can make some uh, uh, observations about uh, tweaking the lineup, or or you know, if they're they're hanging in there, if they're getting better, if it was helpful or not helpful. But uh, I, we're we're in a different era, of course, with obviously less television and radio and media uh, availabilities uh, to boot, right? Absolutely. So how about Game 5 in Moscow? Now, I, I you remember the 72 series. All of the games uh, in the Soviet, the then Soviet Union were played at the same location. Was that the same case here? Yes, it was. And, and was it the um, same arena? I don't even know that. It, the uh, Lesnicki Ice Palace. And I believe it's still being used today. Um, it, it, things went off the rails very quickly um, for Canada. Um, they were... Instead of practicing in Helsinki for the day they were flying into Game 5 or into Moscow, Billy Harris decided it would be better to have a workout at the Lesnicki Ice Palace when they landed. Well, anyone who's traveled internationally knows you can't always set your watch by plane schedules and such. The flight was late. Um, when they landed, um, I don't know if this was actually a plot by the Soviets, but... When the Soviets came to Canada, they were given full customs courtesy. The, instead of having to get off the plane when they first landed in Montreal, Canadian customs officers boarded the plane so they wouldn't get tied up in the airport, check their passports, and then they were allowed to fly to Quebec City. When the Team Canada landed in Moscow for Game 5, it was a catastrophe. It took a, some of the players took three to four hours to get out of uh, the airport. Their baggage was missing. Uh, by the time they got to their hotel, it was almost 9 o'clock in the evening. They'd missed their scheduled practice. A lot of their baggage was still missing. Uh, Gordy Howe and Bobby Hull were, ended up being woken up at 4 a.m. by bellhops bringing their bags to them. And it was The team was very upset. Uh, they weren't happy with the rooms. They were not exactly to North American standards. Um, Billy Harris was upset at missing the practice. They did get a work in the, the following morning, which was the day of Game 5. Uh, before Game 5, Billy Harris went back to his lineup that had won Game 2 with one exception. Bruce McGregor, who had uh, done an excellent job uh, killing penalties. He, he and Paul Henderson were superb penalty killers. Had caught a terrible flu bug in uh, Scandinavia and uh, was too sick to play. So Tom Webster replaced him. But Game 5 was was a disaster for the Canadians. You look at the score, 3-2, you think, Craig, why are you saying that? Well, 
Jerry Cheevers played one of the greatest, maybe the greatest game of his career that night. He had the Soviets talking to themselves. He was so brilliant. Thank you, Don. I do have Jerry Cheevers with me, and it must be a very tired Jerry Cheevers. I don't know if you ever had to play a tougher game than that. Uh, Jerry had to hold him in there for so long, so early, but uh, it was just a sensational night for you and the club, and yet still missed by only one. Well, you know, we've been out for seven days, and, uh, you know, the time adjustment and all that, that's a factor, definitely. But we come back a little stronger in the third period. Uh, I think this is probably the toughest game in the series for, for myself, definitely. Uh, they're an excellent hockey team, and, and I think we're a little uh, stale. And if we can be that close to being stale, then, you know, it's going to be a super series. But outside Achievers and the line of Ralph Backstrom, Gordy Howe, and Mark Howe, nobody else for Canada really showed up. Uh, they seem to be struggling playing on the big ice, um, really mentally out of sorts. And the Soviets utterly dominated the uh, action from from the you know from the time the first uh, puck was dropped. So for the first time in the series, Canada was now trailing and making Game Six all the, so important because if they lost Game Six, they could not win the series. They could the best they could do was tie it. So. It was a really disappointing effort. Um, Billy Harris was also very concerned at two of the two other players he's, he watched in uh, Game 5. Mike Walton had led the WHA in scoring the year before, and he had, he had not had a good training camp. He played well in Games 1 and 2, and his play then began to fade. And his play was so terrible in Game 5 that he, he appeared just to have simply given up, and Billy Harris decided... The bench him, and Frank Mahovlich had played terrible as well. And the Big M had not had a good series in 72, and he just seemed to be really rattled uh, emotionally playing the Soviets. Do I have this right? They only had four shots on goal through the first two periods of that Game 5? I think they had four shots in each period. Oh, each period, okay, but still, uh, yeah, hardly, I, I, hardly anything to help back up Cheevers, who you know can only do so much sitting in the goal. He can't, he can't score them, right? Exactly. Well, in- interestingly enough, in the final minute, Billy Harris tr- pulled, tried to pull Cheevers for a sixth attacker, and Cheevers had almost made it to the Canadian bench when the Soviets broke out. And he raced back into the Canadian net and made one of the greatest saves I've ever seen in my life. But, yeah, it was. Uh, I think Jerry Cheevers felt a little bit like General Custer did on his final day. He was facing a lot of shots that night. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about this series in Moscow, right? Because uh, instead of traveling, right, like uh, in in Canada, right, which is an expansive country, right, three four thousand miles in width, right, you know, going from Quebec to uh, Vancouver, yeah. right, uh, you're literally just going back to the same location. Uh, just yep. an interesting dynamic. I wonder if that helps or hinders each of these teams. Um, I I guess at the end of the day, it's kind of a draw per se uh, when it comes to if there's any advantage. Uh, aside from being the home of, of the Soviets, nonetheless, right? That's obviously an advantage, but still. Yeah, a big advantage. I think it was a big advantage for the Soviets because they were able to go home. And, you know, most of them, those players played in the Soviet Elite League, which my understanding was based in Moscow. So um, they, were, they were with their friends and their families, where Canada was living out of a hotel in a very foreign environment to them. All right, so so game six, right, a, a proverbial must win as you sort of set up, right? I mean, it's clearly, you know, the, what was a, a pretty decent start in this series, uh, some close games, um, seems to perhaps be going in the wrong direction, at least if you're looking at game five as any indication. But if there was any uh, uh, catching up, so to speak, it doesn't seem like game six was the elixir Team Canada was no. on. Well, things went off the rails the day before game six as well. Um I wrote about this in my book. Um, neither Rick Smith or Brad Selwood, outside of just saying how disappointed they were, were willing to talk about it. Um, did, so after Game 5, terrible, terrible effort by the team. Uh, an all-important practice the day, you know, between Games 5 and 6. And Billy Harris noticed uh, three of his players acting rather odd on the ice, skated up to one of them. Um, I, I know who it is, but I won't say. That's not right. Um, the player was completely drunk. Three, those three, three of the players were completely plastered on the ice. Harris was so upset, he, he actually walked off and walked the uh, four miles from the Lisnicki Ice Palace back to the hotel. So what should have been a desperately important practice fell apart. 
What was, that, so that, what was is, that all about? I mean, was it uh, okay? Uh, did people not taking it seriously? Or, I mean, okay, why? How? You, you, you wonder. Um, the three players involved um, were not three of Canada's better performers, I'll say that. But I guess they decided to unwind with a few drinks the night before and just kept going. So it was unbelievably um, disappointing. And in particularly, you know, you think back to the beginning of the series, and Rick Smith told me this. Um, just before the day of game one, they had a, t- a team meeting, and, and uh, Billy Harris said, among other things, he said, when, the, when our plane comes, lands in Montreal, come on, on our way back from Europe, you are going to be so grateful to be a Canadian, to be back home. Um, he said, let's show our gratitude for our country um, through this series. And he also then to commented about how in 1944, his father had put on a Canadian uniform and had traveled to Europe. And, of course, that was, uh, he landed it on the beaches of Normandy. His father died. He goes, I'm not asking you to die for your country, but I am asking you to wear that Canadian uniform with the same pride and the same dedication as my father did. And that just seemed to be starting to come off the, the wheels were coming off the, uh, the car now with that, with that terrible happening in the practice. So we go into game six. Another big concern of the Canadians with that outside of the practice was the referee, Victor Dombrowski. He had refereed game three and the, his penalty calls or his officiating was at times somewhat incomprehensible. And in Game 6, I wrote about this very clearly in my book. I think Dombrowski threw the game. His re- the refereeing was so, if it was simply incompetent, he would have enraged both teams, just like the Polish referee who'd worked, uh, Waldo Chopora, could work to Games 4 and 5. Um, he was not a particularly um, good referee, and both teams were angry. Uh, the Canadians were enraged with Dombrowski, but... Anyway, just go back to the game to start. Uh, Valerie Harlamov opened the score in the first couple of seconds, in the first minute. Rick Lee had overskated the puck. Harlamov grabbed it, moved in, and beat Cheevers. Uh, the Soviets then made it 2 nothing and were dominating. From there, the Canadians began to play better. And um, Ray Jean Oul scored for Canada before the first period ended and make it 2 1. Uh, Gordy Howe playing fabulous hockey. I mean, People were concerned that Gordy couldn't keep up. Well, he certainly was. He tied the game with his third goal of the series, make it two all. Uh, the Soviets made it three two, but it was a, a superbly played game. Both teams were playing really, really well. And then um, I think the incident that um, kind of made it clear what was uh, kind of sealed Canada's fate, shall we say, happened. Canada was killing a penalty to Mark Howe. Uh, Bruce McGregor and Paul Henderson were on. Were out there killing the penalty, and um, they got Henderson and McGregor got a break, um, a two-on-one on defenseman Valerie Vasiliev. Um, McGregor had the puck just before being hit by Vasiliev. He passed off to Henderson, who made a great play, but Trechak made a better, even better save. Vasiliev upended uh, McGregor with a, one of the hardest hip checks I've ever seen. I mean, Bruce McGregor literally cartwheeled over him. And when, when, when McGregor got up, he was, he was hurt. He was trying to get back to the Canadian bench. He got tangled up with Vasiliev. Um, Vasiliev started throwing punches. And um, the, um, Bruce McGregor, remembering the international rules, the series was being played under international rules, which, per, among other things, forbid fighting. McGregor didn't drop his gloves. He didn't throw a punch. He basically turtled. Uh, Vasilya hammered him a number of times before the referees broke, the officials broke it up. Now, under the international rules, the uh, the rule book, uh, Victor Dombrowski, the referee, had already signaled a minor penalty on to Vasilya. That would have canceled out the penalty to Mark Howe. They would have played five aside. However, in international hockey, whoever instigates a fight, his team serves a 10-minute shorthanded penalty. No matter how many goals you give up, you're shorthanded for 10 full minutes. And, the, and if you fight, you're thrown out of the game. Well, Valerie Vasily was one of the best defensemen in the world. So the Canadians were thinking, well, Vasily, he's out of the game now. Um, 
the, the minor penalty will cancel out the Markell penalty. When Mark comes back on the ice, we've got a t- 10 minutes, uh, almost a 10-minute power play to try and score and tie the game. And Team Canada 74 had a much better power play than the previous Team Canada two years earlier. Instead, Dombrowski gave both players five-minute roughing majors. It was unbelievable. Bruce McGregor, the year before, had six minutes and penalty minutes with the New York Rangers for the whole season. And he was raging on the ice, screaming at Dombrowski. Pat Stapleton, the Team Canada captain, demanded an explanation based on the rule book. Dombrowski wouldn't talk to him. And I think that the Canadians realized at that point that they were not going to be allowed to win this game. I mean, it sounds very melodramatic, but I, I truly believe that. Well, and I think you look, I could... you look at the penalty numbers, right? I think Canada had like 33 minutes total c- called against them, and the Soviets only had nine by comparison, right? So, and this is also interesting too because I, so far in these series, it didn't seem like penalties. Both of these series, 72, 74, uh, I guess what people would sort of expect to be a much more, I don't. Know, it's certainly this was if there was any game in either of the series, right? This is the one where penalties really added up and were sort of fast and furious and and it even spilled to the end of the game right where i it seems like the fighting continued at the end very much so so the, the, it seemed like all the life went out of team canada with that call on bruce mcgregor uh the soviets stretched their lead to five to two as the final seconds of the game ticked off um valerie harlamov and rick lee kind of started shoving and as soon as the buzzer went rick lee went for him dropped his gloves and just gave him a a brutal beating. Oh, Rick Lee starts fighting with Harlamov. And they've got a real old Donnie Brook going out there now, and Paul Spears squared off with somebody. And Well, this is what we were afraid would happen earlier, and what the officials will do about this, we have no idea, but Rick Lee started with uh, Harlamov. They've had a feud going all night long. Uh, Paul Schmier got into it with Boris Mihailov. Don McLeod coming off the bench for Canada as the backup goalie started pushing and shoving with the Soviet goalie Alexander Sedelnikov. Um, Harlamov left the ice, uh, skated off the ice, bleeding heavily from his face. They, in the post-game press conference, Soviet coach Boris Kulagin argued that uh, Rick Lee should be arrested. Uh, Valerie or Billy Harris in the same press conference looked at Kulagin and said, "Will Valerie Vasilyev be arrested for his attack on Bruce McGregor?" It was it was it was very it was really bad. There was a lot of calls in the Canadian Parliament that Rick Lee should be sent home. Billy Harris was asked if he was going to send Rick Lee home, and he said no. He said, "Of all the guys on Team Canada, Rick has played his heart out on every shift, every practice." He said he's played hockey to the very best of his ability. He know he knows what he did was wrong today, and indeed, the day after uh, Rick Lee went to the Soviet practice and apologized face to face with uh, Valerie Harlamov, and they shook hands. But it was certainly a very ugly incident. Well, and more shenanigans await in, in Game Seven, right? I, uh, you know, I, I it. Uh... If there's any last gasp that the Canadians had, uh, this was the game to do it in. But um, talk about the dynamics of this, because now it doesn't seem to be the referees per se, but do I have this right? The timekeeper now questionable in Game 7? Very much so. So Canada now has to win Game 7 and 8 to tie the series. They can't win. It's, It's impossible for them to win it. Um, there were the Canadian referee, Tom Brown, who had worked game uh, one, or sorry, game two, and had disallowed, keep this in mind, disallowed the goal by Vladimir Petrov, uh, was working game seven. And game seven was a much, much cleaner game. Both teams were really flying. Play was going back and forth. This would, may have been one of the greatest games Ralph Backstrom ever played in his career. He ended the game with two goals and an assist. Um, and so with um, a minute 32 to go in the game, um, the score's tied for all. Canada, again, has to win. And so Tom Brown uh, blew, a stop, blew the whistle to stop the play with 132 to go in the game. And all of a sudden you saw Jerry Cheevers go racing out of his net and start smashing his stick against the timekeeper's glass and pointing at the scoreboard. And a lot of, other, a lot of the fans and journalists were pointing at the scoreboard 
Uh, apparently, the clock, well, the clock ran for four seconds after the whistle was blown, from 132 down to 128. Tom Brown, the, the Canadian referee, says he looked up and saw the clock run from 130 to 128, so he ordered the timekeeper to put two seconds back on the clock. Uh, the timekeeper said that wasn't possible. They couldn't reset the clock. So Brown, really upset at this point, ordered him to put two seconds on the penalty box clock and ordered the uh, run those two seconds down before you start the, uh, the main clock again. So Canada is desperate at this point. Um, they were still arguing with the referee about the, the two additional seconds, and that is really important. But Brown would not put any more time on the clock. With a minute to go, Jerry Cheevers races out of the net. Paul Henderson jumps on as the sixth attacker. On the ice for Canada at this point is their best line throughout the series, Ralph Backstrom, centering for Mark and Gordy Howe. Bobby Hall is at the point. J.C. Tremblay is at the other point. And Paul Henderson, Paul Henderson is the sixth attacker. The Soviets are trying to clear the puck out of their own zone. The Canadians won't let them. They're all over the Tretiak. And with about two seconds to go in the game, Paul Henderson got the puck out to uh, Bobby Hall. Hall let it go. Back out the side of the net. Canada has pulled their goalkeeper. Here's the loose puck. It's coming out to the blue line and it's out to center. The Canadians have back now with 12 seconds to go. Here's Bobby Hall. Bobby Hall racing to center. The pass to Mark Howe. He dumps it in and the Russians don't clear. It's taken in the corner with two seconds to go. Right in front of the net. He shoots. He scores! He scores! The green light went on. The red light went on. Allow that goal to count. The Canadians are celebrating. The puck went in and out of the net. Um, the red light signaling a goal is on, and the green light signaling the end of the game is on. In North American rinks, those lights are synchronized. Once the green light flashes on, the red light cannot be turned on. The green light signals the end of the period. Watching the play in slow motion, frame by frame, you actually see Bobby Hall's shot go in and out of the net before the green light flashed on. Canada won the game. However, Tom Brown, the referee, disallowed the goal, argue, arguing that the game ended before Bobby Hall's shot went in. The replay made it pretty clear Tom Brown was wrong. The Canadians protested, but uh, the chances of getting the Soviets to agree to count the goal were slim and none. And there was talk after the game that um, maybe the Canadians would go home and protest. Rick Smith told me that um, they, none of the players wanted to really play game eight at that point. Uh, they just wanted to go home. They were so sick and tired of being in Moscow. He, as he said, we played horrible in game five. We got screwed by the referees in game six. We played a, a super game in game seven, got screwed by the timekeeper and I guess by the ref. And it was really, really disappointing. They couldn't have played any better, and they deserved to win that game. So at this point, the series was lost. Um, if they had won game seven, uh, both teams would have gone with their full number one lineups for game eight. As it was, neither team did for game eight because the series was over at that point. Well, despite all that controversy, it sounded like it was probably the more exciting and, and maybe even the best played game of not only the, the I guess, the the group of games in in, uh, in the Soviet Union in Moscow, but but of the series, uh, many would say. I, th I think I think that's a very fair statement, Tim. Um, interestingly enough, you know, Canadians always look at themselves or you know our hockey players as being really rough and tumble and tough physical players. Game seven was without a doubt the cleanest game, and there was a lot less hitting in it than they've been seeing the previous two games, and that seemed to be helping the Canadians perhaps more than the Soviets because the Canadians were really starting to really fly out there, especially on the big ice. So it was just it was an absolute crushing blow, though, for that uh, when Tom Brown made the call. He, I mean, he, he certainly believed he was right. I mean, I, I certainly don't want to impugn Tom Brown's reputation at all. He truly believed he, he made the correct call. He didn't have, and he didn't have the, you know, they didn't have instant replay then. If they'd had it, Instant replay back then, like we see today, Canada would have won that game. So uneventful uh, setup, I guess, for maybe just a, you know anticlimactic game eight. Um, what's the mood? Um, you, you're saying that the Canadians almost 
felt like they didn't necessarily want to play. I, how do the Soviets feel about a game eight at this point? You know, with the series basically defi- decided. Although again, game seven, pretty pretty darn exciting and, and dramatic. Um, h- how does this series end? Well, for the Soviets, uh, didn't rest five of their best players, including goaltender Vladislav Trechak for game eight. Uh, Alexander Sedelnikov played in game eight. Um, Rick Smith and Paul Schmier didn't, uh, two of Canada's top defense pairings who played the first seven games were not dressed for game eight. Billy Harris gave, put Mike Walton back in the lineup. Uh, Frank Mahalovic, who had sat out game seven, went into the lineup. Um, there was one more, still more <laughs> uh, controversy with the officiating. Joseph Kampala, who had nearly started a riot two years earlier in game eight, was working game eight in 74 as well. And I'll be honest, Tim, I don't know how the WHA ever agreed to use him. But in the third period, uh, Canada was trailing, uh, it was either 3-1 to one or 3-2 to two at this point. And uh, Vladimir Shadron sliced open Pat Stapleton's face with a stick. And Kampala simply skated away. <laughs> and uh, Pat Stapleton, who had, of course, put up with Kampala two years earlier, just kind of lost it. He took his glove off. Uh, covered his hand in blood from his bleeding face, skated over to Kampala, and wiped the blood all over Kampala's face and yelled, you know, what the bleep is this? Uh, Kampala you know, gave him a 10-minute misconduct and then gave Shadron a, a five-minute major for drawing blood. But it really was anticlimactic. Um, it, the, the life had gone out of Team Canada at that point. I mean, they put in a decent effort. Um, again, they had originally thought about not playing, but Billy Harris had implored upon them, look, we're professionals, we're disappointed, but, you know, you've got TV networks that are broadcasting this game, we've got 15,000 people who bought tickets for it, we got to play. But uh, certainly the uh, team was happy to get out of there. Um, as I would mentioned earlier, they had no desire to go into Prague, but the Canada had, had, had booked the game with the Czechoslovakian national team. And the Czechs beat Team Canada in that game three to one. With uh, t- from the sound of it, from the media reports and li- listening to the game, I think Canada put in a, perhaps a good ten minute effort in the sixty minute game. They were lucky not to, to lose by more. All right. Well, so so then as we kind of round the corner, then h- how do you how do you put the immediate effect of what transpired? in the series into play like how does that affect the WHA season that year the Canadian psyche I guess that year relative to the 72 euphoria and what are sort of the things that sort of came out of that longer term I know one of them was sort of the idea or this uh, continued sort of uh, interest in having the Soviets and uh, the WHA kind of still somewhat commingled almost like in a I guess, a visitation kind of series uh, in the years to come. What are sort of the lasting effects of this, both near and, and longer term from this 74 version? Um, well, I think in one hand, it showed that the WHA was a very credible league. The, um, the, Soviet, the Soviets were very definitely the better team, but not by a lot. The WHA had some true, truly world-class talent. There were players that, uh, on Team Canada 74 who had never really received um, maybe perhaps the recognition they should have, like people like Ralph Backstrom, um, Pat Stapleton. Um, I mean, they, they, these were some really good world-class hockey players. Mark Howe had played in the 72 U.S. Olympic team at 16. He showed everybody at 19 that he was one of the best young players on the planet in his play against the Soviets. Um, a number of players on Team Canada 74 had career years that following season. Bobby Hall had 77 goals. Andre Lacroix had 106 assists. He was only the second player in major in Major League Hockey history to uh, have 100 plus assists in a year. Um, and then you're absolutely right. Um, from there, you saw the Winnipeg Jets and Toronto Toros the following year stage their training camps in Europe. Um, in 76, 77, the Winnipeg Jets were invited to play in the Izvestia hockey tournament in Moscow in December. And they did, you know, represented the WHA very credibly. The Soviet national team toured the WHA in both 1976-77 and 1977-78. And incidentally, you know, in the very first meeting ever between the Soviet national hockey team and a North American club team, the New England Whalers beat the Soviets decisively 5-2. to two. 
and the Soviets had Valery Harlamov, Alexander Yakashev, Vladislav Trechak. This this was the real thing, and the Whalers beat them decisively. That was that was known as the Super Series. Those uh, those uh, follow on series. They they they, w- they were called that. The NHL had what they called Super Series seventy six with a couple of uh, augmented Soviet club teams touring the um, the NHL. And uh, like I said, the WHA the following year took a one step further, inviting the Soviet national team over to tour the WHA. And overall, the WHA, with one exception, um, played very credibly in those games as well. They, they the message was getting across that the World Hockey Association was a pretty darn good league. So in some respects, maybe mission accomplished, even though it wasn't an outright victory. It was still helping the WHA in terms of its standing amongst the hockey aficionados in North America. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I guess also, too, then, um, and I'm just I'm just not as deeply enmeshed into hockey history as perhaps I, I could and should be. Did this uh, fascination, I guess, ongoing with Soviet teams and, and competition and still Cold War-esque, right, in the 70s for sure, um, did this open up or thaw, if you will, uh, literally and figuratively, the uh, uh, opportunity for Soviet players to come to North America? Or was that still years away? Or, or did this have any effect on the eventuality of, of a more, shall we say, liberal um, uh, uh, talent uh, uh, influx from uh, from well, Russian fe- uh, world of hockey? Obviously very, very uh, strong, uh, as was evidenced in these series. Yeah. Um, well, we didn't see Soviet players actually playing in uh, North America until, I believe, it was about the very late 80s. And then, not then that we saw the fall of the Soviet Union. I mean, when the Soviet teams did travel, they had um, various people with them make to make sure, I guess, that they wouldn't defect. No defections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, although certainly, I think if uh, any North American team would have loved to have been able to uh, sign an Alexander Yakushov or a Vladislav Trechak, that's for sure. So, I mean, ultimately, uh, how does, uh, I mean, it seems like the WHA comes out pretty good in all of this, despite them not lasting much longer than that. But, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I'm maybe I'll put words in your mouth, but did this help sort of strengthen the WHA's hand when it came to eventual merger time? I mean, I, you know, I don't think the league itself was especially strong, uh, a couple of pockets, right? Obviously, the, the four teams that wound up going to the NHL certainly did did make the leap. But did, did this have any effect, The I guess, the relative success, or at least standing, I guess, uh, the professionalism of the WHA? W- was this an ingredient in the eventual, quote-unquote, successful, uh, another topic for another time, merger with the NHL? Or was this just... I, I'm just curious as to what the effect of the WHA in its ability... In the end, I mean, it's it. It doesn't seem to me like it it hurt their prospects at all. No, um, that's a great question. I think, in a way, I think it, it they they were a real thorn in the side of the NHL. And what started really upsetting the NHL as time went on um, was NHL players stopped jumping to the WHA, but then the WHA started raiding the junior leagues and signing some of the top junior players. Wayne Gretzky, for example, his first professional season was in the World Hockey Association. And the NHL was had spent a fortune fighting the WHA, and now they were losing top junior players. And so there was a real impetus, I think, on the NHL to end this war as, as quickly as possible and, as, um, you know, as, um, and save as much money as possible. Yeah, in many respects, this is uh, this series obviously is a a plank in the history of the World Hockey Association, which obviously is the more obvious reason for us to be intrigued for this little show. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I, I guess, I guess the one last question I guess I would ask is, um, I mean, you you titled this uh, in your book the Forgotten Series. Uh, was that just kind of inevitable? Just for anything that could have been done in the wake of this massively successful and intriguing and dramatic 72 series, or were there other reasons why this is forgotten because of the WHA's, uh, you know, going away in 1979 and, and uh, perhaps Canadians maybe not 
willing to remember this one as much as 72. I mean, why is it forgotten as much as perhaps it is? I think for two reasons. First, it was the WHA and it wasn't our best team. And I think from a Canadian point of view, we didn't win. We didn't want to remember it, even though when you look at the results in 74, Team Canada won one, lost four, tied three. You're, you're, and at first glance, you're saying, oh, it was a debacle. They were blown out. And they weren't. The games, with one exception, were well played, competitive, could have gone either way. Um, but we lost. In the end, we lost. And Canadians, it's, when it comes to hockey, we are very. Um, I, I, we want to win. We expect to win. And anything less than a win is not acceptable. And while, you know, I think Team Canada 74 exhibited, you know, you know, behaved themselves, with the exception of the Rick Lee incident, they were cleaner than Team Canada 72. And people like Billy Harris were true gentlemen. Bobby Hull was a one, and Gordy Howe were wonderful ambassadors for the sports when they were in Europe. But we didn't win. And in the end, that's what uh, people want. All right. Fascinating as always. I always learn stuff. And uh, in this uh, particular case, uh, a whole bunch. Uh, the WHA very much uh, really the backbone of this story, considering that all the players from Team Canada came from the WHA. Uh, may it rest in peace. Uh, and of course, we're happy to celebrate it uh, as we like to do on this show. All kinds of stuff that uh, people have forgotten or have uh, moved on to other lives or have just sim simply terminated uh, for whatever reasons. That's our little want on this show. Uh, that book, of course, is called The Forgotten Summit, uh, a Canadian perspective on the 1974 Canada-Soviet hockey series. Uh, it's by our guest Craig Wallace. It is published uh, by lulu.com, L-U-L-U.com. You can get it there, or if you'd like to buy it through us on our website and uh, be whisked away to Amazon, give us a few shekels of love uh, by doing so. By all means, we're not going to stop you. Uh, we're, of course, at goodseatsstillavailable.com, all one word. Just search up this episode with Craig uh, and yours truly. It's episode 199, and uh, you'll see a link to the book there. Just click on that, and uh, away you go. And uh, within the, the magic of Amazon Prime, you'll have it. Uh, within a mere, uh, it could be hours, but uh, at least a day or two uh, at the at the most. Uh, and uh, we thank you for purchasing all of your items uh, through our website. That's a great way to kind of help support the show, uh, especially since we don't charge any stinking uh, subscription fee or Patreon or any of that kind of stuff, at least not yet. Uh, and we appreciate that uh, to no end, of course. Uh, we also appreciate uh, our pal Jerry Payne for putting all of our uh, editorial pieces together. Uh, putting him through his uh, paces this week for sure. Uh, Jerry Payne, Audio Excellence. Thank you, kind sir. And let's see, you want to keep up with this show? Yeah, of course you can. Well, follow us on uh, social media. Uh, we're on uh, Twitter at Good Seats Still. Uh, you'll find us on uh, Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you will find us on Facebook as well. There's a little page devoted to us there, at least as far as, uh, as, as long as we're going to do it. We'll see. Uh, we're not really happy with Facebook these days, but I digress. Uh, if you want to send us email, go right ahead. We are at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. You can subscribe to our uh, little weekly email newsletter. Just uh, search up the website and you'll find a little link to that. And um, geez, I guess that's it. I appreciate you listening to not only this week's show, but just about every week. Uh, and uh, if you haven't discovered all the great shows in our almost now 200 past episodes, uh, they're all there for you, either in the feed, uh, wherever you subscribe. Please tell your friends, uh, recommend us, give us uh, some five-star reviews, wherever you can do that. That'd be great. Or, of course, on the website, you can see all of uh, all the shows there and all their glory with uh, all the great imagery and uh, commerce opportunities available to them. I appreciate you listening and uh, take care until next week. Uh, stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye.